All right. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Pedro Figueiredo. I'm a software engineer. I've been a software engineer for like three, four years now. I'm currently working in single store, and over there you'll mainly find me doing stuff more on the front end side. We usually use React, TypeScript, and a bunch of other front end related tools. You know how front end goes. It's a new tool every day for every new other thing. Uh, and yeah. Today we'll be talking a little bit about TypeScript, uh, and in particular about TypeScript functions, and uh, why do we need a model to build these functions, and how can this model help us, and uh, yeah, how can we, uh, yeah, how, how can this model really help us, and how can we apply this model? So let's head right in. Okay, TypeScript. Is there anyone in the crowd, developers, I, I mean, that have never used TypeScript before? No one, great. So I can skip this? No, just kidding. Uh, so TypeScript is basically just uh, uh, is a JavaScript superset, which basically means that it's JavaScript plus some other syntax in the mix, and that other syntax is usually the types that we put in. Uh, on top of that, uh, any JavaScript code that we do will change our program's behavior because it cannot change logic. And also, you may know, uh, browsers cannot interpret or execute JavaScript, and for that reason, when we build programs in, uh, sorry, they cannot uh, execute TypeScript, and for that reason, we first need to uh, compile that TypeScript into JavaScript, and only then the browser can execute it, and there we go. Uh, yeah, just a light introduction. I know you have all been working with it. It's the great thing ever for the front end, so yeah. All right, so type free, TypeScript functions. This is what we are here today to talk about. Uh, so TypeScript brings to us basically three different ways to build TypeScript functions. And in some cases, using all of these ways, you can build the very same function. Looking at this particular example, we just want to build a function that gets a pet name. We get a pet, and we, re we return its name. In this, in this scenario, our pet can be a dog or a cat, and with union types, it's just like that, pretty simple. Using function overloading seems a little more complex. You'll see that it's really nothing. Some more lines, sometimes it can be scary because it's a lot of code. Pedro, can you try to full screen your browser? I might. Do you know how to do it? <laughs> F11. F11. OK. Let me try that. Uh, OK, great. Nice tip, guys. Uh, and now for uh, generics, the exact same thing. So these three functions you see over here, in union types, function overloading, and generics, they all work the same. They all receive a pet that must be either a dog or a cat, and they will return its name. Don't, care, don't really care about the implementation. We'll see that in the next slide. So this graph over here basically represents how related these, these ways of creating functions are. And you can see just in the beginning of the graph union types. And that's there because they are real simple. They work in uh, really simple ways. And they are made to create uh, dynamic functions, but not complex ones. Uh, so yeah, they don't offer much flexibility. And uh, at the same time, they never get too complex. Right next to it, we have function overloading. Again, they offer a little more flexibility, and they get a little more complex. But still, for the really more dynamic things, when we want to create uh, really good abstractions, they don't work. And then on the very other side of the spectrum, we have generics. And it's really in here far away from the others, because it's where they, they're supposed to be. They are really flexible, but they can get really complex over time. And many times you will look at some generic functions, and you will say, I'm not touching this. Whoever touched this that edits it, I don't even care. Yeah, that happens. Ever happened, ever happened to me, and certainly to many of you here. All right, so union types. <clears throat> union types are really useful when we have arguments that can be typed with one or two or three or four different types. Sorry, I misclicked it. So as you can look at in here, they are really simple to use. 
And again, in this example of get pet name, we have an argument that can either be a pet or a pet owner. And just by using this pipe over here, and we can read it really in English, pet or pet owner, we are specifying that this argument must be one of these types. And yeah, it's really simple. It doesn't get more complicated than that. But then we have the other side of the coin. Because it is really simple, for most cases, it won't work for us. So let's see, when should we be using union types? Uh, union types, as TypeScript docs say, I believe, stick to it whenever it's possible, but many times it won't be possible for you use cases. First thing it must respect. You must be aware of all the types that you want to use before you define your function. If we take a look at this first example, we have a function that says get first element of the array. And uh, let's say that we pass in an array of strings. How do we know if it's a string? Maybe you could put a string in there. But then I want to put a number in there. And then sometime, someday I will put a pet in there. And we obviously can put all these types in there. We can't guess what the users are going to put in that place. And for that reason, union types won't do. It is not scalable. And they just won't work. Uh, and the second one that we must respect is we shouldn't use them. Uh, if the return type uh, changes when we use it. So a really simple uh, scenario over here is get object, where our object is either a pet or a pet owner again. And for this part, all good, OK? We know the types at the time we define the function. It's either a pet or a pet owner. But when we, we return it. And then we are returning an ambiguous type. Like, this will obviously work. But uh, imagine you are the programmer. And you call this function, and you pass in uh, a pet. And you know exactly that the return type must also be a pet, right? And you will get very frustrated, because it will return to you a pet or a pet owner. And the, other thing, the, the same thing will happen if you pass in a pet owner. It will return the, the union once again. And there are obviously better ways to do this. So going in into function overloading, this is really a great way uh, <coughs> of, specify, of uh, creating functions, sorry, when we have multiple signatures that we want to create for the same function. Uh, has anyone here ever used function overloading in TypeScript? OK, no one. <laughs> no worries. So yeah, imagine for, for this, this is a scenario where we want to create a function that uh, creates a, a, person, a person name. A per, th that person can have one name, on, or it can have two names. And this is the exact same function. We call it with the exact same name. And TypeScript we give, will give us auto-completion for both these scenarios. It will give us auto-completion to pass uh, a name, or to pass both a name or a surname. And on the first case, it will return a single name person. On the second case, it will return a full name person. So let's see how can we really implement this in more technical terms. So this is a very common scenario that we have. JavaScript maybe has some of this. I don't remember. This is something that is in the TypeScript box. Let's say today I want to create a function for everyone in my project. And I want to make everyone happy. And there are people that use it like, is it OK to continue? I guess so. Should I continue? Great, awesome. <laughs> OK, so you want to make everyone on your team happy. And there are people on your team that create dates by only using timestamps. But there are other people on your team that create dates by using a month, a day, and a year. How do you do that? You, you create two different functions with two different names? No, you don't. There are better ways. And that's function overloading right here. So the first thing you must think of is, what are, what are your needs? I need to create. An overload, that's what these are called. I call them signatures, but overload are the, the real name for it, is the real name for it. Uh, you create your two overloads, or three, or four, or five. You can have how many you want, and that's it. That's the first step. Second step, it's the more complicated one, in my opinion. It's you need, you need to create a signature that is compatible with the ones that you already created. So let's see how this goes step by step. If we look at the first one, it only receives a parameter, and it's a number. 
OK, so the first parameter must be a number. That's something that we already know. If we look at the second one, the first parameter is also a number. So we can say that the first parameter must be the month or timestamp, and it's a number. These are common behaviors. Everything is looking cool. Let's look at the second parameter. OK, the, the first overload doesn't have any second parameter. So something strange is over here, because the, the second one already has a second parameter. What we do? We say that we have a second parameter, but that it is optional. And it's a number. The same thing happens to the year, and there we go. We have a function overload, then we just need to do the implementation, which is not, is not a big deal, and that's not we are, what we are here for. But pretty much, that's all you need to do. And you could not create this, this type of function with anything else than function overloadings. And why is that? If you only created this function and not the overloads, literally only this, you would be able to pass in two arguments. And with, with this type of creating functions, you can only either pass one or three. There is no in the middle. So yeah, when you have di different, very different, uh, very different signatures, this is just a, a great way of doing things. Uh, yeah, sorry, a little lag in here. Uh, again, it is no, not a magical thing, and for that reason, function overloading can only be done when we are aware of all the types beforehand. So if we, like union types, if we truly want to do something more abstract, this is not the thing. Uh, it is a really good uh, way of uh, building functions when the return type changes depending on the argument ones, like we have seen, I guess, in here, where if we pass one, we return this type. If we pass two, we return that type. So that's one thing that it already fixes compared to the union types I showed before. Or, and that's like the most reasonable thing, if the signatures vary a lot. Because if the signatures vary a lot, it's really easy to just put them a lot there in a really declarative way and see, OK, it, it may happen the first one, it may happen the second, it may happen the third version. And it's really simple to see that just in a very declarative way. And there is still one, I, I put this here, when not to use function overloading. Why? Because th this code over here, it respects all the conditions that we have seen before, but this is something that, although it works, we should not use it. And why is that? So this is the same code I believe I showed last time, where we, it's a get animal, so we pass in a dog, we return a dog, we pass in a cat, we return a cat, and that's about it. This will work just fine. What's the big issue here? This is not scalable, scalable at all, because one day maybe I will have an horse, and the other day I will have a monkey, and the other day I will have a kangaroo. I don't know these days. Uh, and uh, yeah, th this will grow a lot for something that is really easy to do with just plain generics. That's maybe one way where generics will actually be simpler than the other ways. Uh, and yeah, that, that's why. So speaking of the devil, let's move in into generics and let me just take a sip of water. <coughs> right. So this is something I took from TypeScript docs that says generics are able to create a component that c can work over a variety of types rather than a single one. So this basically resumes what uh, generics are all about. They work for every single type that we don't know beforehand. And uh, it's the, really the only way we can create a truly abstract experience and a great developer, developer experience for the consumers. This is like a really classic example where we have a function that is get the first array element. And if we pass in an array of numbers, it will return a number. If we pass in an array of strings, it will return a string. If we pass in an array of, I don't know, of pets, it will return a pet, and so on and so on. You get the point. So what's really the, the big deal with generics, and why, why don't we use it them all the time? All the, all the scenarios that I've talked about, I'm not sure about some of the function overloading ones, but mostly everything that you, that you build, you can, every function that you can build, you can build it with generics. So why don't we do that? Because generics get really complex real fast, 
uh, it's good that uh, it's hard to understand also because uh, the old gurus of uh, programming decided that they would call generics T and P and R and single letter uh, variables instead of giving them good names and then it gets really really hard to to see what's going on uh, and yeah if you look, take a look at this small scenario this is some code that I wrote maybe six or eight months ago in a personal open source project and if someone in there asked me to edit it or if there was a bug I don't know how many hours I would take to just figure out what this does but this is typing some functions argument. But I have no idea. This had more seven or eight lines. I couldn't even get it all on the slides. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if there was another way to do this. I would just want to show how complex fix can get. And if we can, please, let's not use it. So generics solve, it's really obvious what they solve. They solve this problem where we are not aware of uh, the parameters type before we use them. And that's the real problem that we shoot them in. Uh, another use case is when our return type is a direct mapping or close to it. It is very related with the parameters that we have. There is like a third reason we, you may argue that we can uh, leverage the, the constraints we can use in generics. TypeScript give, gives us this opportunity to add some light constraints in there, but don't really worry about it. Um, yeah, TypeScript has this uh, phrase in, uh, in their docs that says something like, I always use as few type parameters as possible, and that's TypeScript saying, so it's not me, it's really the people that know what they are talking about. Uh, and yeah, generic should be our last resort here. I want you to be clear about, that's my opinion, like if you can use other things and get away with more, more simple code, just do it. Uh, let's take a look at this example. So here we have a filter. This is pretty, pretty simil similar with the filter that we have, get natively from JavaScript. Uh, so it, uh, it gets an array, receives an array, and then it receives a function, the predicate, that does the filtering part. In this first scenario, we have the type. Uh, the, the type is a generic, which is the type of the array that we put in. And then we have another generic, which is the function that uh, the predicate that we, we use to filter the, the array, right? And why is this really not good thing at all? If you look at it, you don't need this func generic for anything. It is not helping us with autocompletion. It is not helping us with the re return type. And now you all see my password. <laughs> uh, it is not helping us with anything really. And m many times we just see like an opportunity to use a generic in there and we don't really think about it and it's working and that's it. But no, I if you look at the second version of this function, we are using it plainly as a, an argument. So just one generic, which is the type, and it works the exact same way, but we have way less complexity over there. Yeah, okay, right. Yeah, another thing, like it, mostly when we are writing JavaScript in many pull requests or merge requests, whenever you are doing the reviews, if you see someone doing like a nested ternary with multiple levels, you'll probably tell them, why are you doing this? Just use if statements or whatever. So if you don't like to do it in JavaScript, why should we do it in TypeScript when we don't need it? This is a classic use case where we are aware of all the, the arguments beforehand. We can only have admin, customer support, or client. And depending on that, we are returning a permission level, which, yeah, in this example can be two, one, or zero. I'd say that in this uh, particular case, we should use function overloading. It would be way more clear, um, and it wouldn't allow us this complexity. And imagine that we have one more one more type over here, maybe we would have an even more nested ternary, and it wouldn't get pretty at all. <coughs> so <coughs> after all we have seen, the pros and cons, when to use one, when to use another, it's all very pretty, but those are just rules. 
And I think it gets way more into our head if we really build a model, a diagram out of it that we can consult then and uh, see if we are wrong or right and what path we should be taking. So the first thing that we should be asking when we build TypeScript functions is, am I aware of all the arguments types right now? Do I know right now that I'm going to put in here a path or a string or whatever, or am I not? If you are not, your path is done. You'll be using generics. That's, yeah, that, that, that's it. If you are not, you have other questions to make. And yeah, <laughs> this is a little complex, not really, just a bunch of questions and yes and no. So if we, are, if we are aware of all of them, then the next question is like, does the return type change depending on the arguments that we have? And if not, the second question is like, does the signature vary a lot? If they don't vary a lot, just use union types. That will do. That is the most simple thing you, you can do, and everyone will thank you for using them. Going back a little to the return type change depending on the arguments, if it does change, the next question is like, in here I put more than one level of extents, but it depends on your taste. If you are okay with using nested ternaries all the way in, please forget this rule and uh, just use generics. If you are not, uh, think a little about it, and if it is, it has a lot of levels of uh, extents, then Use function overloading, else, again, go to generics. Uh, yeah, I think we are going here again. Does the signatures vary a lot? Uh, if the signatures do not vary a lot, if the signatures do vary a lot, use function overloading, we have seen that before, there is no real explanation. So, yeah, that, that's pretty much it. That's the model that I want to demonstrate. But now you may be thinking, what is this guy showing? This is like true complex. I don't want to be looking at this all day. This is a waste of time. This is not something that we must be looking every day. Most of the times you already know uh, in an unconscious way what you will be doing. But it's really cool to have something ready for you and to help you and to know if you are going into the right path and you are doing what TypeScript intended you to do with the tools they provide you. Uh, so this is just a, a little summary, a little conclusion of our, everything, everything that we have seen. There are ultimately three ways to create TypeScript functions, to type their parameters and return types. Uh, I'll stick to the simplest one where possible. It's me and TypeScript docs telling it to you. Don't overuse generics if you, if you can. Sometimes it's in inevitable. At least if you are do, using, uh, creating libraries, open source libraries, that's what you need to do. You need to create great developer experience, and that's the best way. And uh, ultimately, follow a system that works for you. I think that one has worked pretty great for me so far. If it doesn't work for you, change it a bit, share it, and I'll yeah, gladly discuss it with you. Not really QA time, sorry. Uh, <laughs> just the final notes. Uh, Follow me on LinkedIn. I am very active there. I share tips on TypeScript and web dev in general. Uh, this is my dev, dev.to something account where I usually publish one article on web dev per month. Uh, I've done it on React, Redux, on TypeScript, on accessibility, many others. And also, if uh, you are interested, Single Story is hiring. It is a great company to work in. I've been there for five months now. And we have like great challenges, both front end, back end, and many more. Uh, and this slide is uh, open to see on uh, slides.com slash Pedro Figueiredo. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. If you have any questions, that's the time. Two questions yeah. about benchmarks. The benchmark for the programmer, what is the way, which is the easiest way, yeah. to do the same thing with the three methods? And the benchmark of the power of the computer and rapidness of execution, yeah. if you write the, the same problem in the three different ways, what will be the, the less um, consuming power of the computer? Right. So the, I guess the, the first question, the benchmark in terms of uh, development with uh, the three ways for the developer itself, 
of course, using uh, generics, it's the most expensive for you. You'll need to, to think uh, about uh, what can be passed in here. Should I be, uh, should I only be allowing the user to pass in certain things? Because ultimately, generics allow you to pass everything you want. And you might have to think, OK, but I don't want the user, the consumers of this function to be able to pass in maybe strings or maybe null. And so you need to constrain it, constrain, constrain it, sorry, to be able to pass in only the things that you want. And then function overloading, it's also a little expensive because you need to create a bunch of signatures and ultimately a signature that is compatible with everything. And for that reason, you may take just a little bit to do it. It's not that hard, but yeah. Union types are really the most easy thing. You just need to put a pipe in there and think of all the possibilities you, you can pass in. Uh, for the f second question, if I remember about the benchmarking, to be honest, I don't really know. And to be honest, if I'm answering you, it doesn't really matter because it will never reach the browser, the TypeScript code. So maybe the compiler will be a little slower sometimes, depending on one of the case. But uh, yeah, I really don't know for sure. Yeah. No worries. Thank you for your questions. I have one question. It's, um, it's one of the options also exists for the TypeScript functions. Yeah. It's using tuples, labeled tuples, yeah. as function arguments. How do you see this fitting into the model? Yeah, I, I've, I've used it before, and I, I actually, yeah, sorry. So what do I think about, uh, what do I think about using tuples for TypeScript functions? I think it's variadic tuples, something like that, the name that I call it. Uh, I've used it before, and uh, honestly, I always went back not to use them, because I found them really complex and that they would really not add anything that I could not reach with the other methods. That's like my, yeah, I never used really, honestly, I tried to use them many times and I always went back. That's what I did. Yeah, if there is no further questions, thank you very much for having me.